Hello, welcome back to Narconon and Scientology Chronicles. I'm Lucas Catton. And for this particular piece, I wanted to talk about Scientology's mental health problem. Now, as you can probably imagine, that can go in many different directions. And we'll take it into a couple of those directions. One of them might be sort of obvious that the deeper you get into Hubbard's writings, uh, you see how delusional he was in, in many areas. And so he clearly had his own mental health problem. But, you know, the, the history of anti-psychology and anti-psychiatry and anti-medical uh, establishment and anti-government and all these things from the paranoia of Hubbard also is uh, a reflection of, of part of the times. Like as he was doing what he considered to be his own research and things like that back in, uh, you know, especially the 50s when Dianetics came out and that's when he really started that's when he really started to make, you know, this, this declaration of, um, you know, supposed to be the modern science of mental health. Well, at the time it may have been modern. It wasn't very scientific and uh, mental health. We are, we're all dealing with various levels of mental health at, at any given time. The biggest thing that I want to point out is that unlike Scientology, the mental health field has continued to evolve and grow and change and accept and study and research and try all these different things and continues to improve in so many different ways. So regardless of what may or may not have been back in the 1950s um, or even you know, prior to that in the 40s and, and after that 60s, etc., cetera, uh, it has continued to be this vast exploration of treatments and therapies and, and different things to help people live better lives. And it's really that simple. And it's accepting of lots of different methods for different situations. It is not, this is, you know, one, one uh, treatment fits all or one diagnosis fits all or anything like that. Now, they're not without fault. There's been plenty of times and, and currently there are plenty of situations where things are misapplied or, you know, misattributed or whatever. Like that's, that's, that's part of living. Like everybody makes mistakes. But... The biggest difference compared to Scientology and Dianetics and all of its offshoots, Narconon especially included here, is that they have been unable to change this entire time. Because since Hubbard's writings, including the, the much delusional ones in the 50s and 60s especially, as he continued on, those words remained in stone and he firmly put in place, as I talked about in, in keeping Scientology working, right? The, the, the basis of their uh, fanaticism. KSW, keeping Scientology working, states that you cannot alter what he did. He is the source of the information and it cannot change ever. And so Scientologists are very hardcore in this principle in that they cannot change and they take what he said word for word, very literally. He's the source of information. He's the only one who can do anything. And since he's no longer around, you can't change what he said. So it has the inability to evolve. I'm going to give you a story to show the, the level of paranoia about how this still continues today. A total lack of acknowledgement or even a willingness to look and see about the advancements in the mental health field, psychology, psychiatry, uh, general counseling, all these different forms of therapy that are helping people lead better lives and to get through traumatic events and experiences and to, you know, improve different relationships and all these tools that are out there and amazing that can, that can be helpful. Whereas they still claim that this field is somehow, somehow at fault when it is completely the opposite. They're the ones that are at fault. So I mentioned in another video, we're talking about Narconon's, uh, situation in Oklahoma where they were being forced to try and get state certification from the Board of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. And back in 1990, 91, that Scientology and Narconon sued the state of Oklahoma. You know, there's this whole big thing. And so I, I talk about that evolution. You can find a lot of information about that back then. Uh, Bob Lobsinger from um, the, the Newkirk Herald back then did a, a lot of research and reporting on it. And uh, in, in many other places, the Daily Oklahoman, etc. So years later, the, the state approached Narconon and said, hey, we have to certify you. We want to work with you. We, cannot, we can no longer just accept your alternative accreditation, which, um, you know, CARF accreditation is a nationally accepted thing, but they don't look at what therapy you provide. 
It is more about standards in documentation keeping, in you know, organizational structure, in policies and procedures, things like that. Whereas the State Board of Mental Health wanted to know and make sure that people were properly trained therapists for their position in order to deliver the services that they're claiming to deliver. Narcanon doesn't believe in properly trained therapists to deliver mental health treatment. They believe in trained Scientology principles. So that was the main, that was the main issue at hand. Narcanon didn't want to change. The state was trying to say, hey, we want to work with you and figure out a way how we can do this. And they were refusing to do so. And to this day, to this day, they are still have never been licensed by the state of Oklahoma for their full program. They wound up working out something where they were just licensed for the non-medical detoxification portion. Uh, and even that they had to fudge in terms of qualifications of people to be able to get uh, people certified and, and licensed, etc. So then they were, you know, certified as a, as a halfway house for a while or something like that. This is Narcan on Arrowhead in Oklahoma. Well, I was out in Los Angeles and uh, this was 2004 and uh, it was early 2004 and we had a, a special meeting about this. And just prior to this meeting, I was at another meeting with the Oklahoma um, Substance Abuse Services Alliance. And I, I talked about that in another video too of how, of how they exploited this organization. And this was a providers group that worked together, that kind of thing. So we were at an event and Ben Brown, the Deputy Commissioner of Substance Abuse Services for the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health came up to me one day and he goes, hey, why are you guys trying to go around us? We want to work with you. We want to have, you know, offer you technical assistance and walk you through the certification process. Tell your people, we want to help. And I had no idea what he was talking about. I had no idea. So I went back and found out that Gary Smith and Mike Sanamon had been trying to approach state senators and uh, other attorneys and Congress state uh, representatives as well to try and go around the commissioner's office, which is Terry Klein at the time, and the deputy commissioner for substance abuse services was, was Ben Brown, to go around them and go around the Board of Mental Health to try and get some form of exemption. So they still were paranoid and afraid, A, because they are, were unable to change and see that this organization wants to work with them and see that they're good people trying to do good things and trying to help them, and B, because they also know that they don't have properly trained people in order to deliver the type of services that they're claiming they are qualified to deliver. So in Los Angeles, at the ABLE building, 7065 Hollywood Boulevard, if you look up, up their site at able.org, you can see this building it was actually an old church or convent or something like that. And uh, on the left-hand side was the president's office wing. And you go up into, it was Rena Weinberg's office at the time, go up another flight of stairs and there is a display area. At the end of that display or at the front of it, there, is, um, there was a conference room huge conference table and this big round window that faced Hollywood Boulevard. And if you're looking at the building, if you look up to the top left hand corner, you'll see this huge round window. Well, we were in that office and it was uh, myself, it was Gary Smith, it was Clark Carr from Narcan Art International, Rena Weinberg, um, Gwenda Byrne, who was the Department of Special Affairs or part of the Office of Special Affairs for ABLE. It was um, Lynn Farney from the Office of Special Affairs. It was Kurt Weiland, who was from the Watchdog Committee, um, and he was WDC OSA, so he was from the Office of Special Affairs. So the, in the Office of Special Affairs, OSA is the, is the arm, uh, you know, people like Tony Ortega and stuff, they call it the, the dirty tricks arm, but they also deal with uh, legal stuff and some PR stuff and things like that. So all these people were in this room, and I think Mike Sanamon might have been there as well. He was the, the local, what they call DLA, uh, uh, Director of Legal Affairs uh, at Narconon, but still part of that OSA network. Uh, but for Narconon, they changed up the title a little bit. So we're all in this room, and they're all talking about how, how can we write a program to go around and change all the, you know, change the laws and make it acceptable, make it safe for us to operate. And in the middle of the meeting, I said, you know, Ben Brown came up to me at a meeting and said, we want to offer you guys technical assistance. We want to help you get licensed. We will work with you. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. They're like, because I, first of all, I was the youngest one in the room. I, I, by, by many means, if I hadn't been so active in the state legislature and with other treatment providers, even as the president of Arrowhead at the time, I wouldn't have been invited to such a, a high level meeting because, because it was straight up, uh, 
OSA. It was, it was, it was an OSA meeting from the, the Office of Special Affairs, the Watchdog Committee, and ABLE, and you know, on down through Narcanon International, Narcanon Arrowhead. And there, I wouldn't have otherwise been invited. So they looked at me like, you idiot. Like, do you not know Hubbard policy? You don't work with these people. You don't trust them. They can't be trusted. And it was, it was absolute insanity because they continued to try and figure out some workaround instead of just simply going through the normal process that every other treatment center in the state goes through. They refused to go through it because they knew they couldn't do the things that were required to be a legitimate treatment center in the eyes of the law. And this is what I mean by the mental health problem of Scientology, is that they continued to believe that Hubbard's words were A, true, and failed to look at and failed to notice the decades of advancements that have occurred since he wrote those things in the 50s and 60s and the amazing treatments, therapies, and professionals and, uh, you know, scientific research and outcome studies and all these things that have come out since then, they still refuse to look at it. And so that is just one tiny example of their real mental health problem. Today, if you ask a Scientologist if they'll go see a, a therapist, a licensed therapist for, for psychotherapy, for counseling, they'll, they will look at you like you're, like you're the devil or like, like you're uh, you know, a vampire. Like they'll pull out the, the garlic or something like that. Like they really fear these people and think that they're terrible and evil and psychiatrists are terrible and evil and all that. Like it's, it's ridiculous. So their mental health problem has created their own paranoia and is also exposing their actual mental health problem. It's also exposing, of course, their, their inability to reform or to, uh, in their own terms, come up the present time. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, they will forever be stuck in the past and uh, they're going to continue to stay there until they fade away. So that's my story for today. Narconon has a piece of that and Scientology's mental health problem. Till next time, take care.